Well, good evening, everyone. Um, first, you know, obviously, it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to educate such a, a large group on some of the issues as it relates to prostate cancer. You know, we were asked to talk about advanced prostate cancer. So for about the next half hour or so, I'll be talking a bit about um, kind of what the current landscape of treatments are that we have and also what, uh, what we expect for the future. Um, certainly, if you have questions afterwards, I'm happy to answer all, any questions that you might have. So let's start with some, some very basics, which is the basics of prostate anatomy. Uh, and as you can see, um, you know, any cancer that, that, that arises in any organ in the body is, is named after the organ in which it starts. So what I tell a lot of my patients is that prostate cancer is called prostate cancer because it starts in the prostate. And in this schematic, what they've outlined here is that this is where the prostate sits. It sits at the, the base of the, pro, uh, of the bladder. It's an organ that um, uh, serves actually a few functions in, in reproductive uh, function. Uh, but as we age, we develop uh, an increased risk for prostate cancer. And so a cancer that arises in the prostate is called a prostate cancer. 90% um, of men who are ever diagnosed with a prostate cancer will have the cancer confined to the prostate. Uh, we you know, call this localized prostate cancer. Uh, and what that means is that 10% of patients will have cancer that's already spread to other parts of the body. So let's start with the first question. Um, well, I think that it kind of messed up there in terms of the lettering there. But um, so all of the following are risk factors for prostate cancer, except excellent, very smart group here. So let's, uh, let's talk about some of the risk factors that we have for prostate cancer. Age. Age is the most powerful pr uh, risk factor for prostate cancer. And as we age, it's actually some uh, you know, studies have shown that men, um, you know, autopsy series that were done for men back in the 1980s and 70s, that men who had died for other reasons, let's say you know, heart disease or diabetes, et cetera, uh, that up to 70% of patients had occult prostate cancer. And what this means is that if a man lives long enough, um, there, there's a pretty good probability that he will develop prostate cancer. Age is the most powerful predictor for prostate cancer. After that, there's some other risk factors that we know about. Race is another one. Uh, African American men are at higher risk for prostate cancer as compared to the general population. And they're more likely to be diagnosed with cancer at a higher advanced stage. Um, it's less common Asian Americans and Hispanic, uh, Hispanic Americans as compared to, to, to non-Hispanic whites. Family history is also a significant risk factor for prostate cancer. Uh, this includes first-degree relatives, brothers, uncles, you know, father. Genetics also play a big role. This is in the category of what we call inherited genetic syndromes. Uh, you may or may not have heard of these two types, but BRCA1, BRCA2. These are um, inherited syndromes that actually increase the risk for breast cancer. This is where you may have heard about them. But they actually also increase the risk for uh, for prostate cancer as well, especially BRCA2. So this is not something that's commonly known. And then diet. So the issue about how does diet you know, increase the risk for cancer? What multiple studies have shown is that, that men who consume uh, diets that are rich in red meat or hi uh, high fat or animal fat products are at higher risk, whereas men who consume greater amounts of vegetables, whole grains, fruits, et cetera, they're actually at decreased risk for, uh, for prostate cancer. So this is something that's important to know. While this is not the focus of today's discussion, I wanted to briefly touch a little bit on treatments for localized prostate cancer. What localized prostate cancer means, that it's confined to the prostate, and it has not had any evidence of spread elsewhere. And you may have heard of you know, treatments such as radical prostatectomy, which is a surgical removal of the prostate. You may have heard of radiation therapy, sometimes used with hormone therapy. And then lastly, the other is active surveillance or watchful waiting. The bottom line is that all three could be appropriate, and obviously for every individual patient, the discussion will be different. But the truth is that no, uh, no treatment you know, plan or this, any strategy is proven to be better than any of the other. So it's important that when you have your discussions with you know, your doctor about treatment options that you really do consider all three of these and understand why your doctor is recommending one over the other. So now let's talk a little bit about prostate cancer, really the, the focus of what we're going to talk about today. Well, let's st first start with a definition. Advanced prostate cancer, also stage 4 metastatic prostate cancer, is that is a prostate cancer that is spread beyond the prostate gland. Next natural question is where does it spread to? 
the lymph nodes in the bone are the most common sites for where, where cancer cells from the prostate, from prostate cancer, can spread to. And less commonly, but uh, certainly things that we do see from time to time, our areas are spread to places like the lung and the liver. In terms of treatments, sometimes we use hormone therapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or radiation therapy. Each can be used at different courses or different time points during the, the care of a patient with advanced prostate cancer. And we'll talk a little bit about you know, how each of these things fit in. Uh, and one of the questions that you might have is that what symptoms might I present with if I had advanced prostate cancer? And there are none that are really specific, but some patients will present with bone pain. And this happens because, you know, prostate cancer, one of the most common sites for it to spread to is the bones. And in, and in that area, it can cause pain. So depending on wherever that particular part of the body is involved, you may develop pain in that area. But there are no specific constellation of symptoms that point toward advanced prostate cancer. This schematic here is just to describe some of the locations where prostate cancer can spread to. So this is a close-up view, internal anatomy, a cartoon of where the prostate sits. And here they've drawn out a tumor that sits here on the left side. And over here, what they've shown here is that if this is where the prostate sits, the green dots here are all the little tiny lymph nodes that sit inside the body. And this is a common area of spread. And the last place is, is, is the bone. This is another common area of spread. The most common place within uh, the skeleton or the, in the areas of bone for prostate cancer to spread to is in what we, it's in what we call the axial skeleton. Axial means the central part of the skeleton. So like the spine, the hips, and those kind of areas. And then lastly, they've shown a spot here on the liver, which is actually relatively uncommon for prostate cancer, but certainly does happen from time to time. So <clears throat> what about this issue of PSA, and how does this fit in with advanced prostate cancer? So PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. It's a protein that can be detected in the blood for patients who have prostate cancer. And certainly anybody who's ever been, you know, has dealt with a diagnosis or the possibility of being diagnosed with a prostate cancer has been the focus has always been on the PSA. What is the PSA number? And even in advanced prostate cancer, uh, patients will you know, have elevations in PSA. But there are some patients who have had a prostate removal or radiation for their prostate cancer will still have an elevated PSA after they've had treatment for their prostate cancer. But on all the scans that get done, such as a CAT scan or an X-ray or a bone scan, to look for the cancer, it can't be seen. And for those patients, we call them, uh, or globally, we call that condition biochemical recurrence. What that means is that there's protein evidence of cancer in the blood, but we can't see it on any scan. The truth is that for these patients, we treat them very similarly as advanced, cancer, advanced prostate cancer patients. Uh, there are certain caveats or certain scenarios where we might... Um, use hormone therapy a little sooner rather than later, but in general, they're managed very similarly as patients who have cancer that can be seen. So now let's move on to what we use as, as treatment uh, in, in, for prostate cancer. And one of the most important pieces of information to know about prostate cancer is its dependence on testosterone. Testosterone is the male sex hormone. It's the equivalent of estrogen in women. And it is globally a type of androgen. Androgen is the term that we use for all male sex hormones, and testosterone is the most active of those male sex hormones. And prostate cancer is exquisitely sensitive to it. This is also the reason why men, as we age, are more likely over time to develop prostate cancer, because the lifelong exposure to testosterone is what increases incrementally that risk for prostate cancer. 95% of the body's circulating testosterone that we can detect in the blood actually comes from the testicles. The remaining 5% comes from the adrenal glands and other peripheral tissues. So when we talk about hormone therapy in, in, in prostate cancer, it involves shutting down the testicular production of, of testosterone. This is what we call androgen deprivation. We achieve androgen deprivation with hormone injections. These are the Luprons that you may have heard of. And before we were able to do that, Patients actually underwent an orchiectomy. This is back in the you know, late 70s and 80s before drugs like Lupron came around. There was just sur you know, surgical removal of the testicles, but we don't have to do that anymore. So what's the take-home message? The take-home message here is that hormone therapy in prostate cancer is not hormones that we give, but rather hormones that are taken away. It's the most important thing to know about this. Testosterone fuels the growth of prostate cancer, 
And so the hormone therapy that we give takes that away in terms of reducing that testosterone production. And that's what those shots do. How does it do it? And I, I don't, certainly don't want to complicate you know, the, the, the story here with a, a fancy picture here. But the way it works is that these drugs like Lupron fall into this category of drugs called GNRH analogs. It's not, there's no reason for you to remember that name specifically. But the way it works is it actually tells this little organ called the pituitary gland that sits at the base of your brain. And it tells the pituitary gland to tell the testicles all the way down there to stop producing testosterone. And that's exactly how it works. So this shot, sometimes men have received it every month, every three months, every four months. There are different ways to get it, but it all achieves the same thing, which is the shot tells the pituitary gland to then tell the testicle to stop producing testosterone. And this is effective in essentially everybody. It's very effective in, in, in doing this. What are some examples of some of these hormone injections that you may have come across? The first are what we call GnRH agonists, and the other is antagonists. These two terms, agonist or antagonist, simply mean, is it a stimulating drug or is it an inhibiting drug? So drugs that are GnRH agonists are, G, are ones that stimulate that, that, that pathway, and antagonists block that pathway. The question you might be asking is, well, wouldn't two of these two types of drugs have different effects in the body, right? If one is a stimulating drug, one's an inhibiting drug, wouldn't they have different effects in the body? And the, re and, and the answer is no. Actually, they have the exact same effect. And the reason is because the way the pituitary gland works is that it either gets a normal, you know, uh, um, fluctuating change in the signal throughout the day, which is how it normally functions. Or if it gets a one signal all at once in one direction of one intensity, meaning either the agonist or the antagonist, it just shuts down completely. So the pituitary gland is very sensitive to fluctuations in, 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 this hormone, in this hormone called GnRH. And when that happens, it just shuts down testicular production entirely. The reason I'm telling you all this is that the drugs in this group, called luprolide, gosserelin, triptorelin, because of the way they work, they initially cause an increase in the testosterone, followed by a rapid reduction in the testosterone. And the antagonists, there is no flare. There is no increase in the testosterone, and it quickly goes down. I'm telling you this because some patients who've started a hormone therapy may have started on a pill medication like Casidex or, or a similar drug like that. And the reason that's done initially is so that patients don't suffer from the increase in the testosterone flare for the first few days of get, receiving the drug. So that's the reason why patients will start on that pill medication initially for a couple of weeks, and that is mainly because of this, this flare that can happen. Important thing, most important thing, regardless of, you know, if, if, about the mechanism and all this other stuff, the most important thing to know is that once androgen deprivation therapy, what we call as ADT, has been started, it's continuous. It is expected to be indefinite. There's obviously a reason why, right? So let's talk a little bit about the side effects obviously a major concern. In the short term, hot flashes and sweats, some mood changes and irritability, decreased sex drive and loss of erectile function, and decrease in muscle strength and energy. These are very similar, actually, to what women experience during menopause. And in fact, it's actually the physiologic equivalent. So what male, you know, men experience with the Lupron injection is what women experience during testosterone. I mean, I'm sorry, during, during, during menopause. The long-term side effects are also similar. Decrease in muscle mass and fat redistribution. Some patients will develop gynecomastia and decrease in bone strength. And lastly, we worry about things like the risk for diabetes and heart disease long term. So what do we do when androgen deprivation is no longer working? On average, the androgen deprivation works for about a year to a year and a half. And when it stops working, that's when we talk about this term called castration-resistant prostate cancer. And what that means is that the cancer is growing despite the hormone injections. So then, in that scenario, new treatments are added to, not in replacement of test, uh, androgen deprivation. Remember, I always said the androgen deprivation never stops. We just add new treatments onto it. And the reason, I remember I said there's got to be a reason why we continue this indefinitely. And the reason is because the androgen deprivation of itself, if you were to stop it, then you would restore the body's testosterone. The testosterone would come back to normal and that would add fuel back to the prostate cancer. So we don't want to do that. We always make sure that that 
the testosterone level as low, as low as possible. The next line of treatments, they focus on the remaining 5% of that testosterone. Remember how I said 95% comes from the testicles, the other 5% um, come from the adrenal glands and other tissues. And we collectively call all of these secondary hormone treatments, we call them secondary hormone manipulation, meaning focusing on that last 5%. Remember, I said that it comes from the adrenal glands. And, and, and one of the tough things here is that prostate cancer cells are really smart. And when they are deprived of testosterone from the testicles, well, they just start making their own testosterone. But the good thing is that we've learned and, and learned about this, and we've developed new drugs to, to be able to fight all this. Um, that really explains you know, some of the major advances that we've had in prostate cancer therapy over the last several years. But the prostate cancers that produce their own testosterone, we call that autocrine. Auto means self. So it makes it for itself. It makes its own testosterone. So when the, you know, the testosterone you know, deprivation stops working, then we have a whole slew of other medications that we can try. The first is what we call androgen receptor blockers. To kind of walk you through this, imagine that there is a cell, a cancer cell. On that cancer cell, there are these receptors. And these receptors are the testosterone receptors. That when testosterone sits there, it causes the cell to change, divide, become aggressive, and those kinds of things. Imagine in this cartoon that this green dot here is actually the testosterone. When the receptor is open, it'll bind and then activate the cell. <clears throat> when drugs like androgen receptor blockers come in, um, um, let's, let's not talk about this middle space here, but let's talk about this space. So um, if there's an androgen receptor blocker, what this does is that these medications will block the receptor and prevent the uh, testosterone from binding and therefore block the effect, the signal effect of increased growth from the testosterone. And these drugs are in that, in that group uh, of drugs as, as flutamide, biclutamide. This is also called a cassidex or nilutamide. And so these are the drugs that we've actually had for you know, a couple of decades now. And the important thing is here, they work on the cancer cell membrane on the outside. And the way they work is to block the receptors from the testosterone binding. And so for some patients who will be on the hormone injections where the hormone injections stop working, then that's our next option. So we have, we have another set of options to further control the cancer cell. The next are what we call the androgen synthesis inhibitors. So this is, now we're getting into the part of the discussion where we're talking about all the new treatments that have been developed over the last uh, five or 10 years. Um, you know, because androgen deprivation therapy, very effective at that 95%. But now the attention is turned toward that last 5% and really how to, how to target all that. And, and, and much of this development has been due to the you know, painstaking work in terms of research in the, in the labs and then eventually testing this on clinical trials that, that you may have been aware of. So this group of drugs called androgen synthesis inhibitors, they block the production of, 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 of testosterone and other androgens. And they work both in, in the adrenal gland as well as the prostate cancer tissue. Remember how I said, Pro the, in that, that the prostate cancer cells will take the testosterone from the adrenal tissue and make their own testosterone. Well, these new class of drugs block the testosterone production in those tissues as well. The important thing to know, and for any patient who's ever been on abiraterone, the drug called Zytiga, is that you had to take prednisone with it. You can't do it without it. And the reason is, is because these, these drugs work on the adrenal gland, they also block the production of normal hormone, hormones that you need, the most important one being cortisol. Cortisol is the stress hormone that all of our bodies need, and without it, we really, you, know, you can't survive. So this, this prednisone is, is given along with the Zytiga as a replacement hormone. So important thing to know, the Zytiga cannot be given alone. It must be given with the prednisone, otherwise it's not safe. We actually have a very old drug called ketoconazole, and you may or may not be familiar with this, but this is an antifungal medication. But when given at higher doses, it's a pill treatment given at higher doses, it can actually have the same effect. It can block the adrenal gland from producing androgens. Um, and this was studied actually you know, several decades ago. It's actually very effective in controlling bone pain from prostate cancer. But the problem was that it was very toxic. It was a very difficult drug to take. Patients developed rash. People had, patients had liver problems from it. It was a tough drug to take. You know, especially in the, you know, again, you know, the toxicity of the liver was very worrisome. 
Now, fast forward to 2010, another drug called abiraterone comes along. Very effective. It also blocks the key enzymes that, your, that the adrenal glands and the prostate cancer tissues use to produce testosterone. But it has very fewer side effects. It doesn't cause the liver problems. It doesn't cause you know, a, a, the rash and, and all these other side effects. And the main side effects are limited to blood pressure, retention of you know, fluid, and, and some electrolyte issues. But most patients who've ever been on Zytiga know that they, most of them don't know that they're really actually on anything. So it's actually really well-tolerated medications, and it works very well. So to focus a little bit on this, this is a drug that was FDA approved in April of 2011. It's an oral medication. It's a pill, 250 milligrams. You take four once a day, every day, continuously. Again, it, it must be taken with prednisone, five milligrams twice daily. And two big randomized trials have shown that it improves survival for patients who have advanced prostate cancer, castration-resistant prostate cancer, and those who have received chemotherapy and those who have not yet received chemotherapy. And slowly, this has become our drug of choice after hormone deprivation, standard hormone depri deprivation stops working. And yet, there are even more drugs to look at. The newest, uh, new dr newest drug on the block is probably this drug called enzalutamide, also known as Extandi or Medivation 3100. These are all different names for the same exact drug. And the way this wor drug works, and again, it all, it all focuses on how the prostate cancer cells become smart in utilizing testosterone. Well, you know, what researchers are going to try to be smarter, which is develop a drug that then focuses on the way, so this is, imagine this is a cancer cell, and uh, this is um, the uh, androgen receptor, the testosterone receptor. The way it normally works is that it goes inside the nucleus of the cell, and, and that's where it does, exerts its effect. The drug, MDV3100, also called enzalutamide, blocks that androgen receptor even inside the cell. So it works on outside the cell as well as inside the cell. And this is one of the things that the cancer cells do to become smarter. So we have to be a little bit smarter than them. So the drug enzalutamide is what FDA approved in 2012, also an oral medication. So that's one of the uh, nice things about all the new treatments that are coming out for advanced prostate cancer is that um, you know, we're, a lot of them are now oral instead of IV. Uh, it's, a four, it's four tablets, each being you know, 40 milligrams, and it's 160 milligrams once daily, continuously. This one does not have to be taken with prednisone because it doesn't affect the adrenal production of, of, normals, uh, of normal stress, uh, stress hormones. And there's actually some data from the clinical trial suggesting that the prednisone actually may counteract some of the cancer-fighting effects. So by and large, patients who get the enzalutamide drug can get it without taking the prednisone together with it. The side effects, some patients will develop fatigue, and that's something that we've seen, and about a 1% risk of seizures. And this was actually really observed in the trials involving patients, and, and the patients who had this had prior seizure disorder, and it was actually observed at a higher dose. At the lower dose of 100, 160 milligrams, it's really uncommon to see patients develop seizures. So again, these two new drugs that came out in, in the last four years uh, have really revolutionized the way we treat prostate cancer. And, as I, and, and similar to uh, uh, Zytiga, it's been shown to improve survival for advanced prostate cancer patients who previously have and have not yet received chemotherapy. So let's talk about a little bit about the past. This is where chemotherapy was. I know I keep talking about chemotherapy. So mitoxantrone and prednisone, this was way back in 1996, so you know, close to 20 years ago. This was the first intravenous chemotherapy that the FDA had approved for advanced prostate cancer. So thankfully, we don't, we don't live in that era today. But you know, the news was actually back then, it really didn't improve survival. It really only helped patients in terms of quality of life. But our standards are much higher now. So you know, for a drug to get FDA approved, it not only has to improve quality of life, but it has to have a significant impact on, on things like survival. Then this drug called docetaxel came around. I mean, you know, some of you may, in the audience may be familiar with this medication. This is an intravenous chemotherapy. It was approved in 2004 by the FDA. And this is the first drug ever to have shown improving survival for patients with advanced prostate cancer. And it was in a randomized trial when they compared the docetaxel chemotherapy against the older drug, mitoxantron. And so the first treatment ever to show improved survival. Now that was 2004. And there was a long period of time where there wasn't a lot of activity in terms of research. And then comes along drugs like abiraterone and enzalutamide. And now there's so many other drugs that are currently in clinical development that, that may end up being FDA approved in the next several years. 
So another chemotherapy drug, this is the one that's most recently approved by the FDA. This is cabazitaxel, which is also called Jeptana. This is meant for patients in whom the docetaxel chemotherapy is no longer working. This was approved in you know, June of 2010. It's an intravenous chemotherapy. The side effect profile is very similar to do docetaxel, meaning that the side effects that patients experience are very similar, and also shown to improve survival you know, after, after docetaxel chemotherapy. So this is another uh, amongst the long list of treatment options that we have for advanced prostate cancer. So let's go on to, uh, to uh, let's change directions a little bit. Let's, let's look at the issue of bone health. So which of the following are concerns related to bone health in patients with advanced prostate cancer? Should I see a counter up here? Okay. Oh, I only had eight responses. But you're absolutely correct. Very smart group. All of the above. We lose bone calcium because of aging. We lose bone calcium because of androgen deprivation. And we lose bone calcium because of the presence of cancer. So let's focus our attention a little bit on bone health, something that is almost equally important as the treatment of the prostate cancer itself. So major concern for patients who have been pro advanced prostate cancer, your doctor may have talked about taking vitamin D supplements and calcium supplements. These are extremely important. Light, weight-bearing exercise, again, very important for strengthening the bones. And this happens because of just the natural process of aging. We lose our bone, uh, bone calcium for that. Androgen deprivation. Remember how I talked to you about the long-term and the short-term side effects of, of the hormone injections? One of the long-term ones is loss of uh, bone mineral calcium. And this happens because as the testosterone is needed for bone health, we take that away, and patients develop, uh, can develop uh, um, osteoporosis. And lastly, the very presence of cancer inside the bone can also weaken the bone. And so when we think about these issues, we obviously are worried about fractures. And so we've developed, you know, over the course of, you know, the last several years, we've developed a couple of drugs that um, really focus on this. So patients may, uh, who have advanced prostate cancer, getting treatment for their prostate cancer, may also get two of these other drugs. One is called zolindronic acid, also called Zomeda. And another one is called denosumab, also called Exgeva. The first one actually has been around for quite some time. It's, it's in a class of drugs called bisphosphonates. And the way they work is that they block the breakdown of the bone mineral calcium. And they're indicated for patients who have had advanced prostate cancer and whom the hormone injection is, is, not, is no longer working. And then another drug, this one's a little bit more recent, it's called denosumab, and it's a monoclonal antibody, meaning that the, 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 the molecule itself is very different. Uh, it, it's a, it targets a, a protein, a cell protein called a rank ligand. You don't need to know what that is. But it's, it, it's a receptor on the cells that are responsible for bone breakdown inside the bone. And the, that group of cells are called osteoclasts. It also has the same indication for patients in terms of advanced prostate cancer. Your doctor may recommend either one or the other. Um, both drugs you know, are extremely well tolerated. Patients really don't have a lot of side effects from them. But the two main things that we worry about is this, this condition called osteonecrosis of the jaw. It sounds like a very scary word. But what it is is that it's a type of severe jaw infection. It does not happen often. But when it does happen, it happens in men who are getting the drug and then subsequently get an invasive dental procedure. So that's why when if, if your doctor's ever talking to you about getting denosumab or getting Zomeda, the most important thing that has to be done before you start that medication is that you get a full dental evaluation. Make sure all the teeth are taken care of, cavities, et cetera, all you know, root canals, everything that needs to be done inside the mouth has to be taken care of before you start the medication. Because once you start it and then get a procedure like that, then it can increase the risk for developing this type of, uh, of a complication. And the last one is one that generally patients don't feel, but it's something that we can test in terms of the blood test. It's low calcium levels. It's rare for patients to develop symptoms from a low calcium level, but it's something that we do see from time to time. So again, take home point, complete dental evaluation must be done before you receive any either of these two medications. But it's extremely important that you do at some point receive these medications because it's very important about protecting the bones. Okay. There's another drug called radium-223. This is a medication that um, uh, just recently came out into the scene uh, a couple of years ago. It's, it's a type of treatment called bone-seeking radiopharmaceutical. So what does that mean? Sounds like a smart bomb, right? So it's actually kind of what it is. 
So it's an intravenous medication, and what it does is it's a protein that delivers targeted radiation directly to the bone. So it's, even though it's in, infused in the veins, it travels throughout the circulation and, and goes specifically to the bones and delivers a very short wave of radiation therapy there. So it's very effective at pati for patients who have the prostate cancer inside the bones, and it's really effective in controlling pain from bone metastases, and also showed that it improves survival in a randomized trial. So again, another in a long list of medications that we have in terms of options uh, for treatment, both in terms of helping patients live better as well as live longer with their prostate cancer. So the last type of cla a class of medications that we'll touch on is immunotherapy. So what does that mean? Immuno means immune system. Therapy means treatment. So these are treatments that, broadly speaking, they harness the body's immune system against cancer. So this is a completely revolutionary way of thinking about cancer therapy. And this is the part of the talk where I, I really do get excited because this is the, the, the future of cancer therapy. You know, so far we've talked about chemotherapy, we've talked about these, you know, andro androgen, you know, uh, manipulation techniques with pills and intravenous therapies, et cetera. And now, you know, we're changing it directly. Now we're talking about immunotherapy. So a whole other type of therapy that we're, we're utilizing in, in both not only in prostate cancer, but in lung cancer and melanoma and bladder cancer and a number of different cancers. So the first one is actually a drug that was, re was actually already approved by, uh, by, by the FDA. It's a drug called Cipulusal T, also called Provenge. And the way this type of immune therapy works okay, is that men who are eligible for this type of therapy will have their immune cells harvested by veins. So you sit, during, you sit in a procedure called a leukapheresis procedure. And during that procedure, they take a, a sample, a small sample of your immune cells. And what they do is they take those immune cells and they stimulate them with various chemicals that focus those immune cells against cancer. And then those same immune cells, your body's immune cells that have now been activated against cancer that infuse back into the body. And then what a, to, uh, what a randomized trial showed is, is that it improves survival over not getting the therapy at all. So this is something that's FDA approved as well. <clears throat> the patients who um, have, have received it, generally uh, the side effects are very minimal. During or shortly after the infusion, patients will develop some mild chills or fever or fatigue. And, and, all, and what this is felt to be is, is the immune system being activated by those cells, meaning the chills and the fever go along with the immune system being activated. But what about the future of immune therapies? Let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. Again, therapies that stimulate or focus the immune system to target and kill cancer cells. So that's ultimately what we're trying to do, target and kill cancer cells. The first class of, of immune uh, therapies that I'll talk about are called immune checkpoint inhibitors, and some of these are only in clinical trials right now. So this is something that we'll see uh, down the road, but these are still in clinical trials, you know, some of which that we're actually conducting here at, at NYU. So the basic principle here, something to kind of learn about how, about the, about how the immune system works against cancer, is that anti-cancer immune cells, we actually have all of these in our bodies. The specific types of anti-cancer immune cells are called T cells. They're a group of immune cells called T cells. And the way T cells work is that, imagine a cell, it's, surround, it's covered in all these antennas. And these, uh, some of these antennas are, are what we call checkpoints. And they function as breaks on the immune system. And they're there for a good reason, right? So when your immune system is activated, let's say because of an infection, et cetera, you want your immune system to be quickly activated to do its job and then shut down quickly, right? Because an overactive immune system for a long period of time can actually be harmful to you. So these checks and balances are, are in place for a good reason. What cancer cells do, okay, is that they take hostage of those immune checkpoints and permanently try to shut down those anti-cancer fighting T cells. The way these inhibitors work, these immune checkpoint inhibitors, is that they block these checkpoints. They block the ability for cancer cells to shut down the immune system. And when they do that, the immune cells are then able to now target cancer and kill cancer cells directly. So it's a completely different way of thinking about anti-cancer therapy. We're so used to talking about drugs that directly you know, affect the, uh, the cancer, whether it's a pill or an intravenous chemotherapy. What this whole type of therapy is, is taking your body's own immune system, which is fully capable of targeting cancer, and just unleashing it on the cancer, I meaning taking the brakes off the immune system. And that's really what, it, what this is all about. There are a couple of examples that I'd like to talk to you about. One is a drug called ipilimumab. It's currently actually FDA approved in, in advanced melanoma. 
So this has revolutionized the way we treat advanced melanoma. This drug and another uh, group of drugs called PD-1 and PDL1 inhibitors that I'll talk about in a second um, have completely changed the landscape of treatment for patients with advanced melanoma, and some of these drugs are now being tested in other cancers such as prostate cancer. So ipilimumab blocks one of the receptors called CTLA-4. You certainly you don't need to remember these individual receptors. It's just good to know that these drugs are out there. And, and another class of drugs block another one of the checkpoints called PD-1 and PD-L1. And so these checkpoints, and there, there's a long list of others, and I didn't want to you know, bore you with too many of the details, but there are a number of different checkpoints and a number of different drugs that will be targeting these checkpoints that are going to make their way through clinical trials over the next uh, uh, five or ten years. So these are immune checkpoint inhibitors. The other class are called immune stimulating treatments. These are the ones that... Um, um, that directly just stimulate the immune system rather than taking the brakes off the immune system. This one is called uh, uh, J591, and what this is is a protein that actually delivers radiation directly to cancer cells, uh, but in a very novel and a different targeted way. Um, new cancer vaccines, DCVAC is, a, is a, a new cancer vaccine that's currently being developed. It's actually very similar to Provenge. Cytokines. Cytokines are proteins that directly uh, stimulate the immune system in a different way than these, some of these other, uh, other proteins that I've talked about. And there's one specifically called interleukin-7 that is also going to be developed very soon in, in, in terms of clinical trials. So this just gives you a flavor of all the different types of immune therapies uh, that are um, either currently being investigated in prostate cancer or will be in the future. So there's a lot of promise for the future. Now I'll turn it back toward the a kind of a little bit of uh, a little bit of blast from the past. We talk about new antigen targeted therapies. How you know we've talked about enzalutamide, we've talked about abiraterone. You know while these drugs are very efficacious, um, you know patients ultimately will have their cancer grow despite these treatments. So the next step is to find the next best synthesis inhibitor or the next best antiandrogen therapy. And so the two drugs that are currently in clinical trials is this drug called ARN509 and another one called ODM201. And when, whenever, you see a, whenever you see a drug that has a, a name that is a bunch of letters and numbers, that just tells you that's still early in development. Uh, but all indications are that both of these drugs are extremely promising for the future. And then within the class of androgen synthesis inhibitors is a drug called TAC700, also called Orteronel, which is very similar to abiraterone in the way it works. But the benefit of this particular drug is that you don't need to take prednisone with it is that it's that focus that you don't need to take prednisone with it. So it's actually, this is also another promising therapy. And lastly, I'll touch on uh, one last, is, which is other, in a category of other new treatments, which is um, not ones that target the antigen receptor you know, or the testosterone signaling in particular, aren't necessarily immunotherapy, but fall into other categories of drugs that are currently in development. So BEZ235, this is an inhibitor of a key enzyme that prostate cancer cells need to grow. This is an enzyme called PI3 kinase, but this is an enzyme that prostate cancer cells, you know, uh, utilize to grow. And, and, and what this drug does is it blocks that enzyme. This drug called LBH589, panabinostat, is another drug. And what it does is it alters the way genes are expressed inside the cancer cells. So another, you know, area of intense research. And then lastly, this drug called AT13387, again, when you see a name that is a bunch of letters and numbers, it tells you that it's still very early in development. But this is in a class of drugs that block the cancer cell's ability to protect itself from other treatments. So not only do we attack cancer cells with treatments directly that are uh, you know, uh, toxic to cancer cells, one other thing that we can do is target the cancer cells' protective mechanisms. So, you know, cancer cells protect themselves against chemotherapies and other treatments. Well, we can block those protective mechanisms as well as a kind of a multifaceted approach to treating cancer. And so this is a, in a class of drugs that target one of those specific pathways. So again, a long list of new old drugs that are FDA approved and a whole slew of new drugs that are currently in development that really offer promise for the future. Okay, so now the bigger picture, right? So after I've given you all of this information, the question is, is, all these approved treatments, emerging treatments, what is the optimal sequence or the combination of treatments that's right for you? And the answer is, is I can't say that for any, you know, the group at large, but everything depends on the individual patient. We have to take into account all your medical history, your personal, you know, personal preferences, the uniqueness of, of where your disease is and how any symptoms that you might be suffering from it. 
things like the PSA numbers and all Gleason scores. And there's, so there's so much individualization that happens with prostate cancer therapy or any therapy for that matter. And so what I would do is I would encourage you to have these times of discussions with your doctor to make sure that um, you, you, you are both on the same page in terms of, you know, this is the right treatment for me. And that, that's extremely important. But I did want to touch on something that, that, um, that you may have been aware of recently at one of the, the big, big meetings that we have every year. It's the ASCO annual meeting. ASCO stands for the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, this is our big you know, um, uh, advocacy group, both, both for patients and doctors around the entire country. They are policymakers and publish research. So it's a big, big group of, of oncologists that meet every year in Chicago. And, and the reason I wanted to touch on, on this particular meeting and, and a specific trial that was recently presented there is because you may have become aware of it. And, and, the, and the first you know, uh, thought that I'll throw out is that, is that over the last five or 10 years, the conventional wisdom was becoming that now that we have all these new treatments that target testosterone and androgens like the enzalutamides, the abiraterones of the world, and all these new treatments that are targeting that particular uh, type of, um, of, of cancer, the pathway that cancer cells use to grow, um, and they're so well tolerated, you know, maybe that these drugs are steadily going to replace chemotherapy, because chemotherapy, is, 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 as some of you in this audience may have experienced, is not an easy drug to take. It's not easy. And so maybe that chemotherapy would be pushed to the back as we develop these newer drugs, these pill drugs that are extremely well tolerated. Well, then what, what happened was that, you know, there's, there's some data now to tell us that maybe this is not actually the case, that there may be some patients in whom chemotherapy should be the first choice. Early, used earlier on when patients first get diagnosed with uh, advanced prostate cancer, meaning at the same time that they're getting their first hormone injection, that they're also getting chemotherapy. And I wanted to draw your attention to that trial. It's called a charted trial. There have been many press releases about this in, in, in the press, et cetera. And, and, and the gestalt is, and the, and, and the message I want to say to you is that what this trial showed is that chemotherapy used in combination with standard ADT, and remember ADT stands for androgen deprivation therapy, the hormone injections that we talked about, and that it improves survival significantly over androgen deprivation therapy alone. And what this, this trial really taught us is that some patients will have an advanced prostate cancer that's a little bit more aggressive than others, and in whom using chemotherapy, which is a little bit more of aggressive therapy, is better to use it earlier rather than later. And what, we, what appears is that from the, from the data so far, and obviously there's going to be a lot of investigation into the, the nuances of this data from this trial, uh, is that the benefit appears to be greatest in the patients who have the high disease burden. And what I mean by high disease burden, we're talking about literally the quantity of cancer. Patients who have more cancer are the ones who are more likely to benefit from upfront chemotherapy. And so I, I, I will you know, close with that, that bit of information because I think it's important, again, when you're having your discussions with your doctor about what is the right treatment for me, it has to include at least a discussion about this and all of the other things that influence you know, decision making. So it's very important that you have these discussions with, with your doctor. And so last question. So which, which of the following is true regarding uh, treatment for advanced prostate cancer? Is it A, recently approved treatments have significantly improved the lives of patients with advanced prostate cancer? Is it B, new treatments are rapidly entering clinical trials and in providing even more promise for the future? And is research, or C, is research in prostate cancer helping doctors better understand how to tailor a treatment to a patient's specific prostate cancer? Okay, I think I've got 18 responses. Absolutely correct. We were a much smarter group at the end of, at the end of the talk. Okay, and so with that, I'll close and 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 certainly open the floor to any questions that you might have.